Hey everyone, it's Barry here. Hope you enjoy the episode and visit us at barrykibrick.com to become part of our community of patrons. Can you become part of a medical revolution? Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick, and my guest, the world-renowned cardiac surgeon and researcher, Dr. Gerald Buckberg, believes you must. Dr. Buckberg is a distinguished professor of surgery at the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, and his landmark research in open-heart surgery has already been attributed to saving over 25 million lives. But he also knows that's a small fraction of all those that could be saved. And with his book, Solving the Mysteries of Heart Disease, he shows why we, the patients, must now take action to save our own lives and those of our loved ones. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses. From podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more. With tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. Dr. Buckberg, it is an honor and a pleasure. Any man who's been involved in saving over 25 million lives is always welcome on my set. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Barry, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here with you. I've watched your show and I've uh, been so fascinated with your insightful way of talking to people. And to be here is great, but the other part is that I look around the studio, I realize that uh, this kid from the Bronx is in a special place with another kid from the Bronx, and that's sort of fun. Well, let's us Bronx boys make <laughs> things happen. This. As I read this, Doc, I said, and in fact, we talked a little bit earlier in the green room, this is a solving of mysteries. This is a true mystery book to a certain way, but it's by uh, a real doctor who's uncovering real mysteries of the heart. But as I said to you, this is really a manifesto. It's a call to action. Because after the first breakthrough you had with blood, carpo, car, I'm uh, never getting that right. Cardioplegia. God, cardioplegia. That was very well accepted right away. Not maybe right away, but fairly soon. And it led to the saving of 25 million lives during open heart surgery. Yet after that time, you've come up with a number of other methods that can be used to treat heart disease, even treat stroke, even treat other parts of the body. And that has been met with resistance. And when I read all the lives that you've actually saved even by doing the things that you've done, but all of them that are not being accepted by the medical community, I say we Bronx boys need to take this to the streets, and that's what this book is about. This book is for the people themselves to read, to see what's available out there, and let them let their doctors know. Well, it's an interesting way you put it. It's, 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 it's about a revolution and a revolution in care, but it's not a revolution where you, like with Brexit, where you do something different to see what happens. This is a revolution with solutions. So you're really creating a revolution in healthcare because the, the cost of healthcare is astounding because the treatments of major problems are very limited, such as we may talk about later with heart attacks and heart failure and sudden death. So I, I think you're, you're talking about a change in things, and it, it gets at the, uh, the, the drive that I have. People always ask me, what, what do you do? And I say, well, I have a, a way of looking at things because I, I discover failure and find solutions. And my life has really been about that, about the fact that I'm grateful that I've been able to implement medical care as it's given but realize there are major limitations, major failures. And I have spent my probably 50, 50 years finding solutions to many of those different problems. But you found <clears throat> the solutions. You've proven them not only in the lab, but with real patients that your teams have worked on. And yet, the medical community is still not grasping onto these things. Now, I know from 
the way you approach your life and the way you approach science, that you don't get discouraged by this because you know that the truth will ultimately win out, but we are losing many lives up to literally millions a year that we do not have to lose if some of your procedures, some of your treatments would just become part of the establishment. Well, you're, you're talking about the age-old uh, obstacle to, to growth. It's called rigidity. And people have rigidity, and that's known in medicine and probably, of course, known in other areas uh, for, for many years. And there's an interesting thought about that, because when you talk about the, the finding an answer, proving it, and nobody uses it, it brought me back to an intriguing um, time when I was applying for medical school. I went to different, different universities to see if they would want to select this person as a medical student. And they would always ask, what's your favorite book, to get a kind of an idea of your breadth of your interest. And I said a book called Cry on the Covenant by, Claude, by uh, uh, Morton Thompson. And it was about a, uh, about a guy in, in, um, in Budapest named Ignaz Philippe Semmelweis who worked in a maternity ward and found that many women, after they would give birth to babies, would die. And he couldn't figure out why they died. And he, went, he did some studying on it, and he found something quite phenomenal. He found the women that, that lived were delivered by the wet nurses. The women that died were delivered by the doctors. He couldn't understand how that could possibly be the case. So he... Um, he realized that what happened is the doctors would deliver the babies, go across the street, do an autopsy, but there's no germ theory. The doctors would wipe off their hands and go back and infect the women. And he said, to, said what you have to do is wash your hands. He told the titans of medicine, and they still exist today, all these titans of medicine that know everything, that you're doing it wrong. And they didn't listen to him, but eventually it did win. It, did, it was right. Because as you said a couple of moments ago, truth always wins. Actually, I want to give the credit. That is what you state in your book over and over. Yes. The question that, uh, the way you answer it though, though, is only God knows the timing. That's right. And that's the problem. <laughs> but now, in fact, when I was discussing this book with my family and telling them all this, I used the example that you used in the story about the washing of the hands, which, by the way, I believe took over 50 years if I'm correct, before their germ theory really came into yes, play and everyone right. started doing it. And everyone said, but that's not going to happen today because today we are all into modern technology. We're all yeah. into change. We're yeah. all, and the truth is, it's as prevalent now as it was, gosh, 100 years ago when the germ theory came about, Very, 150. Th this dilemma you're talking about is a centerpiece of limitations of heart attack, treatment, congestive heart failure treatment, and treatment of sudden death. The, 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 the dilemma you're describing exists today in these three major illnesses that, that uh, are a centerpiece of, of care, but they're extremely limited because they, they haven't addressed the problem. They've addressed the symptom, but not the problem. And it's, very, it's a very fascinating issue. And, and what happens too often is we treat symptoms, not diseases. We don't understand the disease. We have to understand what's beneath things in order to get a good treatment. You always say to, say to somebody, what do you do as a doctor? And you say, what I do as a doctor is I cure disease. And the question you ask, what is disease? And disease is, is a disruption of normality. So your job is to, to return it to normality. But what if you don't understand what normality is? And that's the dilemma we have today. Okay, but Doc, now, you wrote this book in particularly for non-doctors. Now, by the right. way, I think doctors can read this. Don't get me wrong. They are smart yes. enough. I know that. But right. it's meant for people, the average layman. Yes. And it, it is meant to be a call to action so that we become aware of this. And the more people become aware, hopefully like they did 150 years ago with germ theory, it eventually will happen. But you've proven, let's, let's even go to the sudden death situation. Well, you can go back a second to what you said. You've proven it, but people haven't, haven't accepted it. And, you know, you, you say, why is that? And that's the rigidity of the people that are in charge. But we have to have the, the people drive this because the medical community won't drive it. Well, let's talk about the first one, 
that you mentioned, sudden death. Yes. What that is is when you, when you see a person literally mm. collapse and the standard, by the way, you did change a little bit of the standard treatment in it because the standard treatment used to be 60 compressions uh, right. for every minute. You at least convinced them that they need to go between 70 and 100 compressions every it minute. It wasn't me, but that's correct. Okay, but it, it mm -hmm. was not you, but your work that mm -hmm. led to that. Right. And then what the other part was that they gave up after 15 minutes. That's the classic way. 15 minutes, right. you don't revive the person, you're done. You've proven that as long as you add two more elements of treatment, which is after you, you, you can continue, in fact, the CPR for up to two hours right. and not rule it, as long as you then get into the hospital, get them to have two more small procedures done, you've not only went from losing 90% of the lives of those people that had sudden death, but you end up saving 80% of those lives and you do so without them losing brain capacity yes. or brain damage. Correct. Now, I don't know, that's to me way easier to even understand than germ theory when well, you couldn't it, see it. It, it, gets at, it gets at the concept of understanding failure because the, condition, the, the, the traditional treatment of sudden death is CPR, let's assume it happens here, so we got immediate CPR and intubation. And you know that if you, if that happens, there's a 90% mortality rate, and 10% of people have problems. And if you went 15 minutes, you'll never get them back. So you have to say to yourself, why is it that this gentleman or lady was perfectly normal, and then they have a 90% death rate, and they have a stroke? When I started the treatment, I gave them immediately instantaneously. And that's because what you did is you treated the symptom of sudden death, but not the disease. They died because there's something wrong with their heart. So you can't approach this problem without saying, I have to get at the cause. And the steps we, we take that you illustrated are one is you um, give them CPR at a good rate so you have the brain blood flow going for you. Second, you, uh, you can put them on a little heart-lung machine with a groin. People do that very frequently now. Uh, and that can support the circulation better than CPR can. But you don't just sit and wait. You say, okay, I gotta find out what's wrong with the heart. You have to bring them over, diagnose the heart problem, and then implement a treatment that'll make the heart better. So you have to treat not only the CPR death, but find out what's wrong with the heart and fix it. But when you do that, and you continue even with CPR, in your case, you've done it for up to 150 minutes, not just 15 minutes. Right. That patient lived, that patient recovered, and it'll go to the second part of what we need to talk about. When you do it correctly, you even correct the geometry of the heart. And that's one of the things that I think mesmerized me the most in here, was the amount of even cardiologists and heart surgeons who still believe, according to what you wrote, that the heart is merely a pump, and it's not. What you've described it as, it's, it's a helix, it's a double helix sort of contraption that doesn't just pump, but that you say whirls. That, and when you see the heart, mm -hmm. you can see it whirling. And yet, so they see this even, and the rigidity still is in the way. So even a picture's not even worth a thousand well, words. The rigidity's in the way because they haven't tried it. You see, they, they resist getting into trying something new. So they won't add the other two steps. And by not doing that, you're in the never-ending opposition of a treatment that doesn't work, and that's what CPR is. But when the heart's working, it, 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 functions, it functions differently. We don't the, the, what you do when you fix the heart, you make it work normally, and that that's gets into normality. Well, well, let's go to a thing that I, I personally know so many people with pacemakers. Now, again, we know that pacemakers have saved lives. There's no doubt. But without, again, going back to the normality, without understanding the geometry of the heart, the way almost every, I forgot the number you used, is it five million pacemakers mm -hmm. that have been implanted? Those five million pacemakers that have been implanted into five million people did not pay attention so much to not only the geometry, but where the electrical 
inputs exactly. should go and how they could then beat and return the heart to normalcy. Now, you've uncovered that. You took it and you did it a thousand times. And every one of those patients using that pacemaker has a perfect symmetrical whirling heartbeat versus the others that have a different type of heartbeat, one that is not as efficient, one that is not as effective. You've proven it a thousand times, and yet still between the pacemaker companies and the surgeons and the cardiologists, they're not changing. For the heart to beat normally, you have to pace it through its normal conduction system. You can't just put a needle into the left ventricle or the right ventricle and, and pace it. And a person said, named Wigger said this in 1926, if you pace the heart at this position, it doesn't squeeze normally. And you know what? We still do the same thing today in all the pacemaker companies. And, very, and people have done this, this treatment of, of the heart where you actually stimulate the conduction system, the normal highway of, of impulse uh, transmission, and all the hearts do beautifully, as you mentioned. But people don't do it because if you do that, it means you have to make different boxes, different leads, and the cardiologists have to learn something they hadn't done before. And there's, a, there's the infinite resistance to change. And we see this wherever we look. But the beautiful part of this is not the resistance, but there are answers that people can get and use. And that, that's the, the central theme of this. Well, that's what I love about you, doctor, is you literally, when you even are smacked in the face by the National Health Institute, <laughs> and you have been, I, I mean, mm -hmm. literally, not literally, figuratively, but you don't get discouraged. And I, I remember that great Winston Churchill line, I think you might even use it in your book as well, but, you know, success is going from failure to failure without losing encouragement, enthusiasm. enthusiasm. Exactly. exactly. And, and you haven't done that. But yet, as, as readers, when we read this, and, and I'm like you too, I, I can go from failure to failure and know that it's really helping me and really making me grow. But when you see something that's already there and it's not being used, I must tell you, I'm at least frustrated, and I want to help you lead this charge in some way, because this we are talking about is a matter of life and death. It, it's a revolution in, in care that will, that will save many lives and a huge amount of expenses. You know, it's thought, for example, that, that for heart failure alone, that in 2030, there'll be a trillion dollars for heart failure, and that's because it's not treated properly. I mean, it's astounding because you don't, you don't, you're not getting at the disease. Well, so so the, 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 the public has to understand that there are solutions to these things. Well, and part of the solutions lies with your overall philosophies of life, which I think is what makes this such a, a read, is that you are, in a way, I remember after Einstein discovered the theory of relativity, he spent almost the rest of his days trying to figure out the unified field theory, trying to figure out how it's all connected. You have a very similar passion like that because you believe too that nature itself is seldom disruptive in only one way. You believe that everything has a connection. You even take it as far as the shape of the galaxies are very similar to the actual shape of the heart. Right. You're bringing all of this into our consciousness let's let's say but yet if life itself and and people are so apprehensive of these changes we still must continue to battle on as as, as i'll quote you again you say the truth will win but god only knows the timing well i, I almost gotta, titled my book that but i didn't <laughs> <laughs> well we got to get god on our side here what can i tell you i hope we he's got, watching <laughs> I hope he's watching and he's better be wearing the same clock that i'm wearing because or my it, single jacket <laughs> <laughs> so what you know it it is i can't help it 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 made me angry what can i tell you it made you can't me angry you can't be angry but uh, i understand that but at your anger is translated to people that don't like what you do and they get madder and madder at you and try to jeopardize you further. And you have to find a way to make it clearer. In other words, the, the secret of curiosity 
is that curiosity never finds an answer. It finds the next question. So in other words, whatever you did could get better. So you have to aim to make what you did better so it's more powerful for the other person to see and appreciate and, and potentially do. And, and the moment you get, you get into a combative f phase, you lose your credibility. Even if you didn't have much before, they, they don't want to hear from you. So I, I understand the frustration, but, but the frustration for me is not my frustration. It's the frustration of the people who don't get a chance to get better. That's, that's my frustration. Uh, it, it's, it's that you can't translate this uh, clear knowledge proven internationally by different centers into something people want to look at. I mean, there's something in the book, I'm not sure we'll get, back, get to it or not, in, in, in heart failure that we did that's just unbelievable that, uh, that shows the, the limitations of these, this kind of rigidity. It is this rigidity, and like you say, it exists in all life. But I, I, I think when, when I, I go back, though, to when we talked about the washing of the hands, and I sp explained to my family this story, which people know about mm -hmm. that to some extent, but everyone said, but in today's day and age, in today's modern society, I go back to it again, why aren't we able to, we, we, we make changes, our iPhones change every 15 minutes practically. So what is, why is this rigidity still set in there? It, are you questioning that ever? I know you question I don't, I everything. I don't know how you can find the answer. It, it, it exists forever. I, I don't know how to change that rigidity. I think, I think you may have another avenue looking at it as I brought up the, the point about the, uh, about the uh, Ignaz Philippe Semmelweis. The, the titans of medicine didn't want to wash their hands, but they had, to, they had to do it because it was right. So you have to push in what's right and get more and more people to try to do it. But at the same time, when, and by the way, I, I should be, give a little hope to people. You have taken, and you even mentioned it, you have shown this to groups across the world, and those that buy into it, yes. they're doing it, Absolutely. and they're showing you the exact same results. So they're going from a 90% death rate, which of course could be looked at positively as a 10% life-saving, mm -hmm. to an 80% life-saving. So it is happening all over the world. But, but slowly, slowly. But slowly. And, 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 and the, you, you, have to, you have to modify this the resources you have to get your cardiologist want to do these things and you can't you can't marshal the forces Einstein said something interesting he said imagination is better than knowledge and I think that's the most beautiful comment imagination is better than knowledge my favorite by the way is elegance is simplicity confusion is complexity doc one of the things I loved best uh, the sayings in your book was when you had some people visit you in your laboratory at UCLA, and it was a teeny laboratory compared to some of the mm -hmm. research centers out there. And I, I remember you saying that the most crucial space required, I'm reading it exactly, for any lab work is only eight inches, the space between this ear and this ear. In other words, all of it's up in here. And that is, there's a, a, an essence of beauty that allows me to not give up hope if we know that it's only changing the mind. Right, and I, and I think that's the, the key thing, and it's not only changing the mind, it's, it's having yourself have an open mind, not a rigid one, but an open one that can change things. And that's the key part of it, is that, is that you, will, you will change and grow if you have, you have an openness of your thinking. Doctor, I wanna thank you so much for Thank sharing you. your openness with us today and sharing your work and for saving millions of lives. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure and thank you dear viewers for joining us. As always, there's so much more to discuss with my guest, especially one who saved so many millions of lives. So we're gonna try something a little different. Check out our latest feature called After Words, where my guest and I go even deeper between the lines. It's available immediately following this episode at barrykibrick.com. 
So all you have to go to is barrykibrick.com, and this time you'll see Dr. Bruckberg and I, we're going to discuss something very interesting. We're going to discuss his own heart issue, the depression that followed, and what he did to restore himself. But before we do, I'd like to still leave you with these few more words from Solving the Mysteries of Heart Disease. As I would learn from many of the great minds that I come to admire, failure is not the end, but rather only stimulates the next beginning. You cannot be afraid of it. It is one of your greatest motivators. I'm Barry Kibrick. The space between failure and success is only about eight inches. So don't be afraid of failure because success is only that far away. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. To become part of the Between the Lines family, go to barrykibrick.com. There you can join our book club, participate in Q&As, catch past episodes, listen to Barry's podcasts, read his blog, and experience exclusive online features, all at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses, from podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more, with tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. <laughs>